Hello and welcome. I'm Rima Mektabi coming to you from London. These are historic times. COVID-19 is threatening our loved ones. Some of you lost loved ones. Our lives are threatened and there are so many questions and it seems there's no light at the end of the tunnel. Today, we're gonna discuss how we can build a resilient health system. We're gonna see how the Middle East countries did during this pandemic and what to do next. What are the lessons learned? I'm gonna discuss all that with experts in the healthcare system. Joining me today, Dr. Inaya Azadine. She's from Lebanon and a member of the Lebanese parliament, chair of the Women and Children Parliamentary Committee and founding director, medical analysis and pathology, pathology medical testing and laboratories. Also joining me from Egypt, Dr. Ahmed Nouh, Director, Digital Healthcare Business Unit at Vodafone Egypt and Expert. Steve Lutz, he's the Vice President of the Middle East Affairs at the US Chamber of Commerce. And Dr. Rashid Al Hamadi from the UAE, he's the Manager of the Department of Medical Research in the Department of Health in Abu Dhabi. Welcome everyone, and we have an hour of a discussion. Whoever is watching us, please feel free to send your questions wherever is on your mind, and uh, use, use the hashtags that are allocated for this uh, session, which is health proofing and uh, COVID-19, and any hashtag you wish to add and send your questions uh, via the uh, question panel. I'll start with Dr. Inaya Azadine. Over the past few months, Dr. Inaya, we have seen the healthcare systems facing immense, huge challenges, unprecedented. And um, they're trying to cope with the pandemic, whichever way they can. Uh, first of all, what is your evaluation on how they fared? Well, definitely. First, good morning and thank you. Definitely COVID-19 has abruptly changed the way we live, the way we communicate, the way we work, and it had an impact also on a lot of sectors and the healthcare sector is one of them. Um, and many healthcare system had to cope abruptly with this change in the life. And I think COVID-19 gave a great push to the use and integration of digital uh, tools into the management of the pandemic. Uh, well, uh, different countries in the Middle East and the Gulf area also used this tool in order to contain and to reach the public and uh, to make epidemiological um, statistics and information. They used these tools to collect the data for surveillance, for contact tracing and for, con uh, for uh, quarantine uh, control of the, uh, uh, their, uh, their citizens. However, I should say that as much as um, challenges uh, uh, the COVID-19 has posed, it also opened the door for fantastic opportunities if we know how to deal with them for the future and for the management of our healthcare system and shifted from uh, being reactive to being proactive and from treating illness to wellness. Having these websites or uh, data collected on platforms or dashboards means nothing if we don't go one step further. And this, I think, applies to most countries in this area. We have to go one step further and take the strategic decision that we have to collect the data in a manner that makes them usable to extract and to retrieve from them usable information, smart information and smart data that can be transformed into action, into actionable information that will improve the healthcare system, system and makes this shift in paradigm uh, for a better uh, future proofing of the healthcare system in these different countries. And of course, this requires a lot of uh, work, first at, at the level of the vision and the strategy, and second at the level of the standards and uh, all the following steps that many other countries have uh, um, done uh, in the world. 
And if we talk specifically about Lebanon, I mean, Lebanon used yes. to be called probably the hospital of the Arab world and the Middle East. And uh, yes. many people from around the Middle East used to go to Lebanon for the good hospitals, good doctors. That was yes. in normal days. And how do you assess COVID-19 in Lebanon during this pandemic? Well, during this pandemic, uh, Lebanon in the beginning fed, uh, performed fairly well because we, did, we had a limited number of COVID-19 patients, mainly arriving from outside Lebanon. We, did, uh, we followed all the, the, the procedure that we, we've, uh, that we should follow by testing, uh, diagnosing, treating, contact tracing, isolation. Uh, and we had also the lockdown measures in place. But once the country started opening up, we, I think the measures taken at the level of the government were loose and also uh, at the level of the citizens, there was no compliance with the uh, preventive uh, measures that were, they were uh, repeatedly informed uh, about. And this, uh, uh, this ha caused the shift from a focal uh, cluster transmission to community transmission. And we should add to this also, I think, the, although, as you mentioned, we have highly skilled professionals in the medical sector, however, the um, uh, hospital uh, systems proved to be um, unable to cope up with the challenges because of the immature hospital system. You know, hospital system is not only doctors, there should be systems, structures, there should be uh, uh, training, there should be uh, infection control, there should be measures for equipment. Um, uh, for protective equipment and for tra training the staff. I think what is lacking, not only in Lebanon, we lack a strategy for uh, dealing with a pandemic and uh, disaster risk assessment and management was not dealt with prior to the pandemic. And um, this is an opportunity to recognize this gap and to uh, work on collecting all these medical data available now to be able to predict the future or the behavior of the virus and then predict the behavior or how we should uh, fill in these gaps and um, remedy the system in order to be able to meet the challenges in future pandemics or in any other health risk. Yes, uh, I'll, I'll move to Steve. Uh, Mr. Luce, you, have you, we've seen the KSA, Saudi Arabia and the UAE have implemented very strict measures during the uh, pandemic and uh, that's to curb the spread of COVID-19. Do you believe a more digitally, digitally integrated healthcare system could have made a difference in the country's response to the pandemic? Should we head towards more digitization of the system? And this would probably help us deal better with COVID-19. Well, thank you, Rima, and, and delighted to be on here today with you and all of our distinguished guests. And I want to thank um, our friends at Roche for the invitation to be here today. And I, I would, uh, short answer, yes, absolutely. I think um, capturing uh, the uh, potential uh, that digitization officer offers us is very important. And I'd say that, yes, there was a sudden urgency across all sectors, uh, not just in healthcare, to accelerate uh, the adoption of digitization. Uh, we saw in UAE uh, that they had, in many respects, already embraced uh, rapid transformation across the public and private sectors uh, by digitizing government services really across the economy. And in uh, Saudi Arabia that you also referenced, uh, Rima, they had begun down this path uh, envisioning this transformation through digitization uh, as part of Vision 2030. And um, I would say that the prioritization for this has been accelerated greatly due to the pandemic. And beyond making it a priority and allocating the resources, I think it's also important to consider the policies and the regulations uh, that guide how these technologies will be utilized and how citizens and businesses and other stakeholders interact with the government. In many respects, uh, the Middle East is a greenfield when it comes to regulating this space. And I think as uh, Dr. Inya mentioned, uh, it's important for governments like the UAE and Saudi Arabia and really those across the region to understand that the policies they put forward around big data and privacy and the cloud, that those policies are going to uh, impact how that data is utilized. And it's important 
uh, for governments to strike at a proper balance between the secure protection of data and the need to access and utilize it. Uh, if not, then you'll have policies that will stifle investment and innovation and the very benefits uh, that these digital technologies uh, offer us. I just underscore the importance of getting that, getting that balance right when it comes to the policy and the regulation of uh, these digital technologies. So we've, you've spoken about Saudi Arabia and the UAE. They are on the right path. However, if we compare the rest of the countries in the Middle East, uh, some countries still do not have the proper infrastructure for digitization. Uh, many people do not have the proper access to internet or 4G or 3G. And um, the communication between the uh, health systems are not there. Um, how far are we from the rest of the world when we compare the Middle East to the, to, the, to the more advanced countries when it comes to the digitization of the healthcare system? No, I mean, another, another great question. And I, and I think the pandemic has really underscored, you know, the challenge of um, both uh, making healthcare more affordable, more accessible, and more reliable, and then the last point I would say more equitable. And on that point, I think you're absolutely right that there needs to be more investment and more focus. And I do think that what we've seen as a result of this pandemic is a is a the really it's really got the attention of government decision makers that there's going to need to be an investment uh, in these types of technologies. Um, you know, when you look at the UAE and, and Saudi Arabia and there's a huge opportunity for governments across the region uh, to draw upon the expertise and the experiences of multinational healthcare companies and certainly those uh, ICT companies who have already dealt with um, the, both the challenges and the opportunities, not just in the Middle East region, but around the globe. So the idea of bringing together healthcare experts from companies such as Roche uh, to the table with technology giants like uh, IBM and Google and AWS uh, that have that global expertise, I, I think that would be a good path forward in having that discussion with uh, our government decision makers. Uh, the important thing there is that we have those partnerships, that collaboration, that cooperation, uh, bringing stakeholders together to find solutions uh, that will ultimately bring about better health outcomes across the Middle East. Uh I'll move to uh, Egypt. Uh, from Cairo, I have uh, Dr. Uh, Ahmed Nouh. Uh, what would you say are the critical steps uh, that are required, that are needed to ensure that a data-driven solutions can be uh, implemented to bridge the gaps and to move forward with the healthcare systems in Egypt and in the Middle East? Um, I believe that the data is the king and it's the only thing that uh, is really now considered a very valuable asset uh, that we all build on, especially when it comes to uh, healthcare of an individual. Uh, data structure and data architecture, how it's done inside different uh, technologies and systems are critical, especially from starting from the data entry uh, point where uh, the adoption of different um, healthcare uh, uh, experts or uh, physicians or nurses using technology, how the data entry is done inside the technology and inside the system, and how we give them uh, platforms that are user-friendly enough and simple and following the standard or uh, international protocols that follow the standards that can support um, a data collection in a manner that you can build on it data analytics in the right way. And the data analytics is considered very critical uh, after the data part of collection because that's the entry point. And then um, how you build your data uh, analytics platforms to, uh, to be able to make uh, a decision. And this decision should move, move from uh, a concept of a, a, pro, a retroactive uh, decision to a proactive decision and move to a, a wellness approach rather than an illness approach and disease management only. And this should take even to the personalized health care uh, and personalized medication, medical management for specific uh, cases. So when we talk about Egypt specifically, how did Egypt do during the pandemic? And um, you have a lot of rural areas whereby technology is still lagging, probably just like any other country in the Middle East. So how far are you? And what is needed in Egypt to just go into a digitized 
healthcare system and convince people of it? Uh, actually, uh, the convincing, uh, I would take it from the last part, which is convincing the people of uh, digitalization. Uh, it's it's a convincing is not uh, now uh, an issue because it's part of uh, an inevitable approach with the generations coming. So um, I believe it's coming. However, it's a, a national approach not only in healthcare but in all aspects of uh, the digital government. And this is a, a national project led by His Excellency the President that a, a national government, the national uh, um, approach is an electronic and a digital uh, approach. In all aspects, one of them is healthcare. And in healthcare, uh, I believe that the uh, Ministry of Health had uh, did a lot of um, great efforts in terms of uh, the digital part, especially they launched a, a healthcare app with that had uh, more than two million uh, family subscriptions on it and they were able to send personalized messages according to diseases and disease management so if you have a diabetes you receive a different message than if you have hypertension and this was a, a great effort from the public and uh, a lot also of uh, opportunities that the public uh, created for the private sector to support and to help uh, rural areas, uh, infrastructure of technology are raised and uh, built up there now. And we believe that uh, nearly there is no uh, place in uh, Egypt that has no connection either uh, on a landline or uh, a mobile uh, connection 3 or 4G. I'd just like to remind whoever is watching us <laughs> of the handles uh, on social media. It's uh, at Rosh Diagnostics Middle East, Future Proofing Healthcare future proof health and uh, you can use uh, hashtag the Middle East of course and has hashtag future health live all of these are circulating on social media I'm moving to the UAE to Dr. Rashid Hamadi uh, Dr. Rashid uh, I, I live in the, U in the UK in London but uh, when the pandemic started in March I fled to the UAE and uh, the UAE did well at least that's my assessment um, what was the recipe for uh, doing well? Uh, how do you assess the UAE's experience during the pandemic, knowing that your healthcare system was still under construction, you're still building up and building hospitals and attracting uh, uh, expertise and uh, good doctors from around the world? Yes. Thank you very much. I'm really honored to be uh, around um, a great uh, panel such as uh, today's. Um, and um, um, to just give, have a snapshot of what we have done during the pandemic, it's just um, a reaction, uh, action and reaction, but this was not based on immediate uh, events and then later on um, uh, reacting to them. The healthcare system in UAE has uh, been um, uh, adaptive enough so that we can... Uh, uh, move on to uh, fight pandemics. Uh, I just want to point out that the way we have handled uh, the idea of healthcare system during the pandemic was a, in a very positive way. Um, the UAE has uh, used a very positive language to inform and educate and raise the awareness of the public uh, in order to uh, create a specific uh, um, lockdown system, not necessarily lockdown, they would use for example, national disinfection. So this positivity in raising awareness, in addition to uh, uh, the transparency uh, with the public, was key in driving a swift mobilization when it came to testing healthcare management and establishing treatment centers, even ad hoc, immediate, uh, during the peak of the pandemic. Um, and I think uh, this has led uh, to a concerted effort on all the levels of the uh, major cities in UAE, uh, which created a consortium of efforts so that the response that is actually faced in Dubai or Abu Dhabi is also faced at the points of entry in Fujairah and also uh, all the way across the borders of UAE. In addition to that, uh, we also had, being a leader of uh, medical research at the uh, Department of Health, we have mobilized our forces and our, our individual healthcare facilities in order to focus on answering questions that are related to the pandemic. And as a result, 
we have focused on diagnostics, uh, therapeutics, and epidemiological aspects of it. And this has shifted tremendously uh, to being in par with the international standards. Uh, I think uh, the coordination of uh, various stock, uh, stakeholders uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in UAE at large and in Abu Dhabi in particular was accelerated due to the pandemic and there would have otherwise uh, been a, a slower if it, if it weren't for the vision and the concerted effort of the, uh, of the, of the public, of the healthcare leadership. Um, uh, and I think yes. digitally, yeah, if we want to uh, speak, yes. Yeah, Sorry. I, I wanted to follow up on the digital, on the digitization. I mean, the interesting part in the UAE is that the testing kits were ready even back in March. I mean, this is still a debatable topic here in the UK, for example, which is usually very advanced medically. I mean, the vaccine is being discussed just over here in Oxford University. It's one of the institutions working on a vaccine for COVID-19. However, in the UAE, it was interesting. By mid-March, you had kids and uh, it was via the app. I, I could go to the app of the um, of the uh, Ministry of Health and, Hassan, and then I can right, see right. my result exactly. So well, how right. far are you when it comes to digitization and is the public responding? Yes, uh, digitally, I think uh, I just want to put, go back a bit. Digitally, meetings between political leadership and healthcare leadership have been have become completely virtual and anything would be transmitted immediately from the top down or, you know, cascaded down to the level to the individual levels of people on the ground who are carrying out the tests. Um, uh, applications like uh, the ones you mentioned, for example, Al Hassan is one of them and others uh, are there to make sure to tr not necessarily to track individuals down rather than to track the, the movement of the virus itself. And not only that, uh, again, from research uh, perspective, the topics of even looking at individual um, uh, sewage areas of certain um, communities within particular cities uh, were implemented so that we can mobilize our forces right there in that particular area if we suspected any uh, growth or any um, uh, uh, surgence of, of, of any uh, of the virus itself. Uh, and this really has transformed our uh, response to uh, to the pandemic. And in future pandemics, I think we will be even more ready, um, you know, more, more ready than we are today. I'll move to Naya and we'll stay on the digitization of the healthcare system. And also we will discuss more the personalized healthcare system. Uh, Dr. Inaya, uh, I know you, on a personal level, when you used to be a minister, you fought the battle for digitizing the healthcare system, and uh, you were you just needed a signature, which you never got, and the Lebanese never got, and uh, it didn't happen. Uh, I'm not going to discuss why that's not the topic, but uh, how far is Lebanon from a fully digitized healthcare system, and what what are the dangers if uh, countries don't go towards this path. You know, I was fighting not to have only the health the healthcare sector digitized. I was fighting to have the whole country become a digital country because everybody has interest and the way uh, the current way of of uh, doing the the digital business in a fragmented way is not effective and is not uh, is not cost effective also. Um, the best way, now we have silos of digital uh, areas and different sectors of the, of the country, but this does not lead to a cost-effective, uh, citizen-centered and uh, uh, citizen-centered solutions that respond to the citizens' need. Uh, because you need, uh, we need uh, an infrastructure that would lead uh, make make it uh, easy to access uh, uh, open integration of all these data. Um, you know, we need an infra. Uh, uh, as I said in the beginning, we need a whole of strategic decision to make a whole of country 
holistic approach to digital transformation that is citizen centered and this necessitates you know you know in Lebanon we have a problem with power and prob problem with communication so in the beginning this necessitates the hard infrastructure of having an, uh, an inclusive uh, communication infrastructure that uh, and not only in the urban areas but also in the rural areas we need fiber optics reaching all the country and this is one drawback now we need also internet um, uh, accessibility to all the citizens and this is also a drawback now and uh, I think the COVID-19 has exposed how much digital gap we have uh, within uh, within uh, the, the the country and this uh, if it cannot if it's not dealt with I think it will to lead to digital exclusion and later on digital exclusion nowadays will lead to social exclusion and this will make our problems even bigger and bigger uh, we also uh, need uh, data platforms uh, uh, designed within a digital uh, infrastructure that will set the standards for open platforms data platforms and the standards for uh, cyber security and the, the privacy and this will lead to uh, make it easier to have personalized digital healthcare. But what is really important and is a key element in all of this is to have a, the common, the common uh, digital identity. I mean, we have the, the common component, which is the digital identity. And I will explain how. Imagine that you have a digital identity, you as a citizen, where all the data relevant to your health come to one platform where, uh, in a usable way where, um, uh, the, um, for example, your doctor can have access to this. Not only we can make, we can make the treatment and the management plan of patient um, cheaper and not only we make it in an easier way and more accurate, but it will also help us predict future maybe uh, health problems that a certain citizens can, citizen can have. But all of this necessitates that we have a good governance for the data uh, in order to have standards, though we want the data to be shared, but we want it also to be protected and to protect the, um, the, the, the privacy and identity of, uh, of our citizens. This also will, will help. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead, please. This also will make it more practical for Lebanon and for uh, to share this data in research with other First in Lebanon, imagine we have all this data, then this will help fire research and fire uh, innovation in, in many sectors and also in health, but it will also help us uh, collaborate with other countries, provided we have um, alignment of the strategies for the data sharing and for the governing the privacy of, of patients. Mr. Lutz, uh, uh, you're coming to us from the USA, and uh, data is king in, in the world of the uh, healthcare system and public health, but data sharing is something that's very debatable. And, you know, countries in the Middle East, some, many of them don't favor data sharing. There's the privacy. In fact, the culture in the Middle East tends to hide sicknesses and diseases. Sometimes we don't call diseases with their own names. And now with the corona, there are public campaigns in Lebanon, for example, to just not hide, to say that you have corona and it's not a taboo and share the info because you might have infected someone else. This whole culture of data sharing, whether on the societal level or on the healthcare system, where is it when it comes to the uh, Middle East and uh, What's the danger of not sharing data if we compare to the rest of the world? Well, thank you, Rima. And, and as you and Dr. Ahmed both said, uh, data is king. Yeah, I think this is, and Dr. Inya, I think was really hitting on some really important points there that, you know, to realize the full potential uh, of, you know, big data and the digitization technologies 
you do have to get that that regulation uh, of these technologies right. Um, for example, you know, at the U.S. Chamber, you know, we firmly believe that governments, you know, to get data protection right, should avoid kind of a, a one size fits all uh, superstructure, if you will, of data protection, um, and instead uh, support an approach that recognizes across the economy, across different industries, uh, that they use data differently. Uh, that you need to allow for legitimate uses uh, of personal data uh, by businesses, by the medical community. And you certainly need to empower uh, consumers uh, to make informed choices. And uh, I would say first and foremost, yes, uh, the importance of cross border flows uh, cannot be underscored enough, um, you know, because we're talking about, you know, a medical community that's global and you need to be able to, you know, transfer and move data uh, around the globe, whether that's for clinical research um, or just to, you know, to be informed and, you know, to work together collectively. And when you're making these decisions, I, I think it's really important for uh, government decision makers, you know, to come to the table uh, with those in the private sector, with those in the medical community, and to have a, an honest and transparent discussion uh, about what are very challenging issues, but very important issues, and they're very important to get right. Um, so that would be, you know, our first and foremost um, the thing that we would encourage uh, in our friends in government is to have that type of collective discussion and to really try to hash through um, these types of very important issues. Yes, uh, I'll uh, move to Dr. Ahmed uh, from Egypt. Where is uh, Egypt when it comes to data sharing and which countries are you working with? I mean, of course, you need partnerships between the government, the private sector, and the community. Uh, but then again, countries are talking to each other. Now, suddenly governments are heavily involved in healthcare systems. Uh, security is involved all over the world. Uh, we see police in the streets here in the UK to stop people, to organize people, not to spread the pandemic. So when we talk about Egypt, Egypt, who are you coordinating with and how is the data sharing? Actually, as uh, Mr. Rutus has just said, uh, uh, the data governance and the data structure is something uh, that uh, is still uh, now uh, developed. I believe Egypt has already developed a law for the data governance and data security. A lot of items are identified in this uh, part where uh, data access is something that you need to uh, clearly study how it fits not only from a technological and security and cyber security and governance perspective, but from a cultural perspective too, because there are some dimensions, as you give an example, uh, taboos sometimes it is. Uh, so cultural um, uh, aspects and uh, tracks should also be uh, considered. In Egypt, um, currently, uh, there is a, a huge uh, major transformation in the healthcare uh, platforms and systems where uh, data is uh, under the security uh, measures uh, that is followed by the government uh, that keep the records in a secured way where only the patient and a treating physician can have an access to. So um, this is internally yet uh, talking to other governments on um, uh, data is not yet, I believe, in place. However, uh, the main part that uh, Egypt started to develop, that we have the infrastructure of the data based on international standards, like using the ICDs, uh, ICHI codes, for example, that is coming from the WHO, or that is, can be mapped with different uh, coding systems across the world, so that there are standards of coding systems that you can uh, communicate with, which is clearly a very important part also uh, via the data communication between different uh, organizations to build a, a clear a structure of what to be communicated, especially when it comes to research uh, and building a, a structure of uh, analytics that can help everyone. Dr. Rashid Hamadi, uh, I'll, uh, I'll start with you where I ended with uh, Dr. Ahmed Ruh research. Uh, Ahmed Ruh. Uh, research is important these days. Uh, we see that the countries of the Middle East, especially the uh, rich ones, are more inclined to invest in infrastructure, technology, uh, defense, uh, and tourism. But when it comes to medical labs and research, we don't 
see that there's a lot being invested there. We have some of the oldest universities in the Middle East between Cairo and Beirut. The UAE and Abu Dhabi has very advanced universities. We don't see that they are tied to hospitals, they're not tied to research labs. How far is the Middle East and what should leaders do when it comes to research and also the importance of digitization and its impact on medical research? Sure. I'll go back to the um, idea of, uh, I think uh, our colleagues touched upon real world evidence and you yourself has mentioned, uh, have mentioned something about the fragmentation of the data. And uh, Her Excellency and I also uh, mentioned that too. Uh, real world evidence, for example, um, uh, as exemplified right now to the best of uh, 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 world practice, w would need clean data. A concerted uh, repository of data where uh, I can really come up with predictive anal predictive analyses of what's going on in our in our um, healthcare arena, and I think still the Middle East at large still is yet to be mature enough to reach that level. And we are uh, in fact um, partnering with uh, Roche and we're partnering with other uh, world leaders in as as far as uh, real world evidence. To, to be collected in the cleanest way possible so that we can have strategic uh, uh, implementation of future um, data analytics in our healthcare system. So that's um, the first aspect. The second is when we want to have a clear and uh, well-established medical research, we need to have uh, policies and governance, appropriate policies and governance and standards that need to be implemented across the board within uh, you know the not necessarily within the emirate of Abu Dhabi but at large at the uh, countrywide and also uh, in the Middle East at large uh, and I think we have been able to uh, in the past couple of years we have been successful enough in order to implement few policies and, and introduce new strategies and, and standards for our healthcare facilities in order to be evaluated on their quality uh, uh, healthcare services including and also having giving some weight to research output and by research output we 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 refer refer specifically to translation translational research where research can be Im implemented immediately into a practice and or a change of policy if needed uh, as a result of the conclusions of the research uh, and the department of health in particular uh, in abu dhabi we, and also at the, uh, at the national level, we were able to, con to consolidate uh, experts from the uh, uh, institutes of higher education you alluded to earlier, like Khalifa University, UA University, and other uh, uh, universities, Abu, uh, New York, uh, Univer uh, Abu Dhabi, New York University, uh, in Abu Dhabi region. Uh, we were able to recruit even uh, experts from public healthcare uh, sector and also private healthcare sectors to put them on, a commi on committees uh, to review ethical uh, issues regarding COVID-19 research uh, projects. And as I mentioned earlier, we, uh, you know, the in initial phase of the projects were just uh, normal projects that you would not really, um, uh, would not really um, uh, lift lifted to be or considered to be a, a top-notch uh, research projects. And as the pandemic progressed, and you know, I'm talking about six or seven months, uh, the topics became very much uh, uh, focused on, for example, even uh, DNA analytics, the, the, the individual sequences of the COVID-19 that came from East or West or European or Canadian or other areas or parts of the world. And that's how specific our, our research system has become. And not only that, not only in diagnostics, but also in management and therapeutics, for example, when we um, introduced our uh, uh, plasma therapeutics, uh, uh, the you know we were you know uh, we were in par. I think when we consulted with the U.S. officials and, and experts, they were really amazed at the level that we have been implementing uh, our uh, you know therapeutics within that uh, arena, um, and also um, we have uh, success successfully engaged government and private uh, corporations to have a successful implementation of vaccination and vaccine introduction into our uh, into our country and i refer to specifically the back the chinese vaccine for example which had been introduced um, about three months ago 
and up until now uh, no adverse serious adverse event or effect has been reported and and things are moving very smoothly uh, accordingly and and because of our success our uh, neighbors in bahrain and also in egypt and ksa uh, uh, saudi arabia they actually were partnering uh, partnered with us in order to implement a multinational uh, uh, vaccine introduction uh, in, into their countries. So um, I think uh, this is just in, um, in a nutshell uh, what we have been engaged in and I think we will be happy to invite our colleagues across the board that are you know in the panel here and whoever is listening to us from the world to join us in our effort in our research efforts in order to uh, become you know even more successful uh, the more and the merrier and the better of course the more data we have the more centers we engage with, the better and the more solid uh, our uh, solidified our knowledge and evidence would be. I'm going to pass on some of the questions that I'm, I'm getting from the public, whoever is watching us. So please feel free to send more questions and uh, whatever is on your mind. Uh, our experts on the panel uh, will be able to answer them and I'd like to and uh, remind you of the handles it's uh, Roche Diagnostics Middle East, Future Proofing Healthcare, Future Proof Health, at Future Proof Health, and uh, also uh, Future Proofing Healthcare and the hashtag Future Health Live. Uh, Dr. Inaya, someone is sending you a question from Australia, Hamad Hoku. Uh, he's saying, Can you highlight some of the steps you would like to see from Middle East governments should take for this health crisis? Also, the government health exchange will have this in the coming years. How will the Middle East governments address this expense? You know, uh, first, I think I would like to see this all the governments build on the experience they have gained on the lessons we learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, a lot of them had to uh, to use uh, technologies that they were not using before, like telemedicine and, and, and other things. Uh, and um, I, I invite them to adopt a national uh, digital transformation strategies um, um, for not only for health, but it's a general one, standardized for platforms, for data, for privacy, for cybersecurity. And uh, as far as health is concerned, these platforms should collect longitudinal deep data uh, concerning the genomics and all metabolomics, uh, proteomics, and also as the, the uh, distinguished speakers mentioned, the uh, real world data and other health data in order to make it accessible to all the researchers to come up with um, preventive uh, preventive uh, measures at the level of individuals and at the level of the society and make innovative services that are uh, oriented towards our uh, citizens uh, need uh, this also this of course necessitates a um, uh, um, big efforts at the level of the legal, regulatory, ethical frameworks that have to govern this data use and data sharing uh, nationally and internationally. I would like to see our governments learn from the experience of other countries and uh, um, pave the road for collaboration along this path um, for a better future of our of of, of our nations and internationally, uh, and this I think will make health services uh, less expensive and more accessible. Uh, of course. Yes. Uh, the next question is uh, for Mr. for Dr. Ahmed Nuh. It's coming from uh, Muhammad Kamal. How can digitization? of the healthcare systems achieve the balance of accessibility and efficiency, that challenge which is simply both HCPs and patients are currently facing due to current status of COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Nuh, the question is uh, for you. Uh, actually, uh, the, 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 the accessibility of uh, digital healthcare uh, is something that uh, everyone uh, uh, ha has to work on. Uh, 
the balance between healthcare systems accessibility and digitalization is by building a structured, uh, simple, uh, user-friendly, uh, I would say even uh, it should be a free of charge app, uh, usage of these technologies, is by uh, su supporting the treating physicians uh, by adopting the technology, promoting their presence, and I believe um, that also uh, having the national uh, support and the private sector support on this to have a, a massive reach on the ground by giving the access uh, to the doctors reach, reaching their patients and the patient uh, reaching their doctors. And it's not only on the level of a consultation or a simple consultation, if we do it as a telemedicine uh, consultation, but this can be even adopted up to the level of the uh, major hospitals, emergencies, uh, ambulance services, how, is, how it is uh, managing this. And um, the technology will always evolve and will always be a dynamic approach. It's the matter of um, how we build uh, the stamina for our uh, treating physicians, because the new generations will always keep using technology and it will uh, invade all the aspects of our lives, link it to uh, payment methodologies, either the national insurance systems or the universal systems, uh, or uh, link it to the out-of-pocket part and how you can connect your payments to your uh, medical records, so you are connecting your financial world to your uh, health world together uh, under one uh, reachable, simple platforms. And you have even uh, support from uh, financial and microfinancing institutes in case uh, the universal coverage is um, limiting you for any reason. It depends on each country according to their uh, laws. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Steve, uh, Mr. Lutz, I believe you have a comment. Yeah, I just uh, there's there's been some discussion around the, the topic of investment in government investing. And while I would say um, rightfully so, first and foremost, during the pandemic, we've focused on the lives lost and the, the families that have been impacted. Uh, it's also important, of course, uh, that we won't forget that there's been incredible economic devastation uh, in terms of shuttered businesses, bankruptcies, massive unemployment. Uh, strained public budgets and just overall historic economic decline. So when we talk about investing in the future and building resilient health systems, we're also talking about creating greater economic resiliency. And that's an important point for government decision makers to consider uh, when they talk about, you know, looking where they're going to allocate um, very limited resources. Uh, so we would encourage government, uh, government uh, decision makers to invest in people, to invest in technology, to invest in the time, you know, to bring together uh, thought leaders and experts to get those policy and regulations right. Uh, I'd also mention uh, on this same theme, just last week, actually, uh, the chamber released a study on rates of return on health investments. It specifically, the study did look into economic and social returns on investments in prevention and the treatment of chronic diseases across about 27 countries. And the findings were that uh, in those countries, on average, uh, you would realize a return of $20 in productivity and gains and workers' lives for every $1 invested in cardiovascular disease and diabetes interventions, uh, really underscoring the, the point that in investing is critical, uh, that it really ties into economic resiliency. And one other point I would just mention uh, on investment, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into uh, determining where um, where private sector deploys capital. And one of those, uh, you know, specifically when you look at uh, research and development, uh, which we've thought about, is the protection of intellectual property. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention um, major credit to the UAE, uh, which actually just last week we learned about um, a new decree that establishes uh, what we believe to be the, the highest standard of intellectual property protection across uh, the Middle East Africa region. So while it's not the only factor driving investment, it's certainly an important one uh, for the very innovative life sciences companies that we're talking about that are going to bring those vaccines forward. Thank you. Mr. Lutz, when, when, we, when we talk about future-proofing uh, healthcare, we are talking about uh, planning ahead, uh, our life forward also. So the world has dealt with COVID-19 now by pressing a pause to everything in our life. And the, 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 the solution was lockdown. And people have been confronted with either 
I'm not going to say die of starvation, but yes, they're going to suffer a major economic crisis because they're losing jobs and they're not productive and businesses are shutting down or you're exposed to COVID-19 and you get sick and uh, probably die. Uh, in the future, is the lockdown always a solution? We're, we're, we're heading towards a wave two uh, of COVID-19. How should governments deal with this while keeping the economy uh, ongoing one way or another and saving people's lives? Yeah, really, that is the million dollar question for sure. And I think, uh, you know, the, the important consideration there is that the governments take uh, advice from those in healthcare, that, that they're the experts. And it's really important that there be uh, an appreciation across society, both the citizens, the businesses, the schools, uh, that they look to the advice of the healthcare community uh, to guide those decisions. Uh, now, striking that balance uh, between those considerations and the economic considerations is absolutely pivotal. Uh, but that's where I think you see the acceleration um, of the adoption of digital and other technologies uh, will be absolutely critical to bring about uh, better solutions, not just in the healthcare sector, but in uh, across the economy. And that's uh, certainly, I think, going to be the case going forward. Uh, and it's also the sort of collaboration and discussion that can't just take place on a national level, but that it has to happen on a regional and certainly on a global scale. Um, but you're absolutely right, Rima. That's uh, the, the crux, I think, of the discussion going forward. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move to Dr. Uh, Inaya Azadine uh, in Lebanon. The world is heading towards a personalized health care. Uh, is this happening? Do you see it happening? Is it more cost effective, in your opinion? Uh. You know, personalized health care is still in the beginning, uh, not only in Lebanon, everywhere, and it needs a, a, an infrastructure also. And we have been, digitization is a, is a very important component. The digitiz digitizing health care is a very important component of the personalized health uh, health uh, system because we need this data that we were talking about, this um, health that are relevant to every individual to be able to tailor tailor um, treatment, tailor the wellness of a certain individual according uh, not only to his symptoms, not uh, not according to the one size fits all, but according to his genetic, to his proteomics, metabolomics, to his uh, life, to his work. You know, health is one one parameter of the wellness. It's uh, wellness is so many factors and health is one and you need all this information combined together to be able to come up with a preventive proactive uh, plan for a certain individual uh, health uh, and this cannot be done without this di digital transformation um, uh, uh, will uh, we have to go this way and uh, provide all the components that we have been discussing during this episode uh, to be able to reach. But of course, this is a better way. And I think this is an optimal way of, of dealing with health at the, uh, looking at it as a wellness rather than treating illness. It's more cost effective. Uh, it's better for the research with better outcomes. But this also faces many challenges at the infrastructure level, at the governance level, but also at the inequality and discrimination level that can that has to be dealt with. And this is a major decision that governments should take. They should start it, they should have the vision of it, but they should partner with all the stakeholders in the public and in the private sector nationally and internationally. This is a call for international cooperation. You know, viruses don't know borders. And I think we cannot succeed in fighting this pandemic and future pandemics without this international collaboration based on standardized way of looking, on, of analyzing, collecting, analyzing, and sharing this data. Yes, uh, I'm going to finalize quickly with uh, answers, uh, with questions from the public. And uh, uh, the second question is going to Dr. Rashid Hamadi. 
uh, and really please uh, quickly answer uh, uh, briefly before we end this panel, what role public and private partnership could play and how open the government is about this? Uh, I'm going to move to the other questions later once we get an answer from you, Dr. Rashid. Sure. I think uh, PPP, public-private uh, partnership, is uh, key to success to any um, endeavor, not only in healthcare. I believe it's, uh, it's uh, across the board. Uh, and I think uh, what we have done recently in Abu Dhabi and in uh, UAE at large uh, is we have um, been uh, in contact with the uh, corporations, major corporations, for example, pharmaceutical companies, um, uh, biotechnological companies, to introduce um, uh, uh, new cellular therapeutics, for example, uh, into our healthcare system. I just want to uh, cite an example here. I think in the 1980s, uh, I happened to come across a paper that spoke of uh, T cells being manipulated within within the um, uh, uh, within the petri dish. Of course, at the time it was from animal source, and the author at the end concluded that this particular methodology would set the stage for future cellular therapeutics. And I think today uh, we are speaking or talking about something like CAR T cell therapy, where we uh, take our T cells and remodify them in the lab and then reintroduce them back into the patient to make sure that his own immune or her, her own immune system uh, fights, uh, you know, different and various diseases. And, and that's in, in itself, you know, 20 or 30 years ago was just a dream or just a concluding part somewhere in the hidden in the papers uh, of, uh, of a scientific paper. So I think one, one of the major steps that we can take right now is to invest as much as possible in basic scientific research because who knows 30 years down the road a small discovery that you're making today could lead to a major breakthrough in the future um, uh, you know of health that will impact health health uh, the health care of, of millions of people dr rashid another question to you coming also from the uae ahmed magdi saad is asking you uh, what is the short-term and medium-term vision in terms of incorporating data and health technology assessment in the UAE? If you can answer briefly, please. Yes, uh, I'll, try, I'll try and do this as briefly as possible. We have uh, created a, a digital strategy within our DOH, led by uh, leaders in the uh, strategy division. Uh, and I think um, uh, real-world evidence is another aspect that, that uh, we need to uh, focus on, and we are currently actually engaged in uh, with uh, multiple corporations, including Roche. Uh, and um, one important aspect also that the, the panel discussed early, earlier on was the accessibility of the data to different data analytics and data analysis experts. So we are working on these things, and I think these would set the stage for future digital healthcare that would be hassle-free. And now the question from Ayman Ibrahim from Lebanon to Steve Lutz, Mr. Steve Lutz. How do you evaluate the level of collaboration across countries around COVID-19? Really quick, please. Yeah, well, I would say, you know, it's, it's good, but there's always room for improvement. I, I think, you know, governments reflexively uh, sometimes like to uh, keep the decisions in their silo. Uh, but I think the pandemic has uh, brought forward the need uh, the urgency to be more cooperative. And I'm speaking in general terms, of course, but absolutely there's always room, more room for improvement and we're going to get the best results if we bring the best and the brightest um, across our society to the table to tackle these important challenges. Uh, I'll move to Dr. Ahmed Nuh because we haven't heard from him in a bit. Uh, whose role is it? We've seen governments heavily involved in the past months. They're going to remain heavily involved, but we need pharmaceuticals, we need companies like Roche, we need the public, we need universities. How is this whole relationship? Who's leading this war against COVID-19 and such pandemic? Uh, I believe it's uh, the role of everyone uh, with the leadership of the uh, definitely uh, the national systems. Uh, it's a government uh, lead uh, across the globe, not only in a specific country, because uh, as my colleagues mentioned, uh, viruses does not know borders. And in the meantime, it's uh, not only the, the public or the national systems that would uh, do this alone. They cannot. 
I believe the support of uh, pharmaceuticals, diagnostics like Roche and other uh, multinational and big organizations, uh, telecommunication companies, um, technology companies, uh, research companies, it's the role of everyone. Even the educational systems should include a part related to uh, how digitalization should be and uh, our new uh, medical colleagues coming and under education should be also involved in this uh, from the start to be part of their genes that digitalization is, is a part of healthcare. It's not something that is new, it's part of their genes. So how is data is managed and analyzed, how they look at it. So it's a, it's a full ecosystem led by the my, from my point of view, led by the public, definitely. They are the, the bodies that they can set the governance, the rules, the structures, uh, the policies, the procedures, and with the support of all the organizations uh, on the ground, including even the individuals. Thank you. Uh, our time has ended. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Rosh Middle East for this panel. And I want to thank you, esteemed uh, panelists, and everyone who is watching us. Dr. Inaya Azzeddin, Dr. Ahmed Nuh, Mr. Steve Lutz, and Dr. Rashid Al Hamadi. Thank you. I think we can go on and on and on because we're living such historic times for this pandemic. All I can say by the end of this panel is be well and be in good health and keep working uh, for us and for the public to find solution, solutions for this pandemic. Thank you, everyone, and thanks for being thank with you. us. And thank you for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you.